One of the best things about visiting Staten Island is the ferry ride from Lower Manhattan. It's free, and you get a great view of Manhattan, the Statue of Liberty, and parts of Brooklyn and New Jersey. Staten Island is the third largest New York City borough, and home to around half a million people, the smallest population in the Big Apple, and probably the least diverse. 75% of residents are white. Our first stop is the Staten Island Gem, the Alice Austin House. It's a two and a half mile walk from the ferry terminal, so it takes about an hour. Longer if you stop to take photos along the way. Alice Austin is a self-taught early female photographer. Danielle Bennett works at the Alice Austin House. The museum has a collection of around 8,000 Austin negatives. We know that she started taking photos when she was about 10 or 11, and we don't have anything from then. Um, most of what we have is when she was a teenager uh, into a young woman, uh, 20, 30. Um, and then she ends up taking photographs basically from the late 1870s until the 1920s. And Danielle says that this is the only museum in the world devoted to a female photographer. Born on the island in 1866, Alice lived in this Victorian cottage almost her entire life, and she was the only child in a house of adoring adult relatives. This house actually still looks much like it did when Alice lived here, and we know that because Alice documented inside and out of the house, every inch of this place, and her favorite view to document was the one right outside her front door looking at the ships in the harbor. It is a gorgeous view, and people still come to the museum, even when it's closed, to just relax and sit and stare at the water. Alice Austin wasn't just a photographer in a time when there were few independent women artists. She was also a lesbian and lived with her partner Gertrude Tate for 53 years. They openly lived here alone together, and that's one of the things that I think being wealthy and white and privileged at the time can get you a certain amount of allowance. They wouldn't have called each other lesbians because that just wasn't uh, that just wasn't a phrase that we had in our vocabulary at the time. But their charmed life began to unravel when Austin was in her 60s. Like so many at the time, she lost all her investments in the stock market crash of 1929. Her thought process led her to think that it would blow over and everything would recover, so she mortgaged the house. Um, she ended up losing the house. The, they fell behind on their mortgage payments. They did everything they could to try and save it, and they tried doing many different things, but eventually um, they sold the contents of the house and they squatted here for a time. Mm. And then eventually they moved into an apartment down the street, um, a small apartment, they were on welfare. The sad story has a somewhat happy ending. In 1950, when Alice was 84 years old and still living in a poor house, her photographs were rediscovered. That led to an interview and photo spread in Life magazine, which gave her enough money to move into a private nursing home. There ended up being a celebratory day called Alice Austin Day that she got to attend where some of her work was put on display and people got to come and celebrate her. She said at that event that she was happy to know that people are taking joy from the photographs that once gave her such joy. Austin died less than a year later, leaving a valuable legacy. Her photography served as a lifeline for many lesbian artists in the 1970s and 80s who were looking for images of themselves in his previous work and looking to find themselves elsewhere in the world. She loved Staten Island. She loved it here. She didn't have to live here if she didn't want to. She loved this house. She loved the ground. She loved everything about it. And I think that there's a, a lovely sort of bookend to the fact that this place that she loved so much is now beloved by so many people in the neighborhood and it's used as a constant park and meeting place uh, and a quiet reflective place. This area of Staten Island used to be upscale, but as we walked along the waterfront northwards toward the ferry terminal, we saw a different side of the island. And then 
there was this. We went inside and met Scott Van Kampen, who is the co-founder of this community-based non-profit workshop called Makerspace. The space we're in was actually my architectural and sculptural metalworking shop for the last almost 15 years. Uh, we were flooded in Sandy. We had three and a half feet of salt water in here. And that was sort of the impetus to get us to sort of switch gears. And we opened the Makerspace one year to the day after Sandy. We have a lot of uh, artisans, uh, we have entrepreneurs, we have people that are prototyping things, um, people with ideas that, you know, they're trying to uh, maybe learn some skills. Even though much of this neighborhood seems neglected, there are new developments springing up. It's real important for us to not look like we're in one of those depressed neighborhoods. We're doing our part here, we're, we're really trying to maintain a foothold in the community. Um, we have not only the makerspace here, we have uh, taken over a 27,000 square foot lot across the street from uh, where we're at here at the makerspace. Uh, from the city, we got a, a lease on the property to uh, make a sculpture park. What a lovely discovery and a great resource for Staten Island entrepreneurs. As is often the case, Walks New York stopped off at a craft brewery just a short walk from Makerspace. Flagship Brewing opened its doors in 2014 and makes excellent beer. Walks New York will be back on Staten Island. There's a lot to explore here. Until then, happy rambling. <laughs>